Next talk is by um, uh, Yitzhak Ben Shabbat, Michael Lindenbaum, and Anat Fischer from the Technion. Hello everyone, my name is Itzik Ben Shabad. I'm a PhD student from the Technion. My supervisor are Michael Lindenbaum and Professor Anna Fischer. And today I'm gonna to present a work on 3D point cloud classification using a convolutional neural network and our new representation called 3D modified Fischer vectors or 3D MFV for short. So, okay. So in modern autonomous systems, they're usually equipped with many RGB cameras, but also some sort of uh, 3D acquisition device, whether it's a LiDAR sensor or an RGBD camera. And what we want to do is to take a point cloud and classify it. Much work has been done for RGB, RGB images, but uh, much fewer work on point clouds. And there's a reason for that, is that point clouds uh, have significant challenges that images do not have, and you can uh, subdivide into three main categories. So the one category is there, in point cloud, there's no grid. In images, there's the, it, you can represent it as a matrix and on, on a grid of pixels. Uh, while on point clouds, well, you can represent it as a matrix, but it's not a grid representation. Um, Second, the data is uh, permutation invariant, meaning that same matrix that represents your point cloud. Uh, you can subdivide, you can exchange the rows and you have the same point cloud but a significantly different matrix. And most often the point cloud, you don't know the number of points you're going to sample in advance. You have different numbers of points for different objects. And this is to add up on usual point cloud um, challenges, which include missing data from occlusions, different types of noises, and rotations in the data. So I should mention some prior work that tried to tackle this problem, mainly the point net and point net plus plus methods that uh, uh, basically apply multi-layer perceptron on each uh, of the points, or the KD network that um, basically enforces a, a, a structure into the K, KD tree. Um, Another type of uh, method is, the, is converting the point clouds into voxels, but this is limited uh, with the voxel grid. It requires a lot of resources. There's a balance between accuracy and resources in this case. So what we propose is a hybrid representation, but before I get into that, I should um, talk a little bit about uh, Gaussian mixture models. So a Gaussian mixture model, it's a generative model, and in our case, we're going to use a, a, a uniform very coarse grid of Gaussians. When I say coarse, I mean somewhere between three and 16, very coarse grid of Gaussians, and they are uniform and spherical. This is crucial for the structure that we're going to create, and this basically what enables the use of 3D convolutional neural networks. Um, second, we're going to use uh, something, the, the term called Fisher vectors, which was well known, known for the uh, feature aggregation method. Um, so basically what we do here is we characterize the data samples by their deviation from a generative uh, model, where usually the GMM is estima estimated using uh, expectation maximization algorithms. In our case, we're using uh, the Gaussians on a grid. Um, so, this gives the property of being uh, invariant to permutations because when you compute the Fisher vector, which is basically the derivatives of each of the samples uh, with respect to the model parameters, and when I say model parameters, I mean the means of the Gaussians, the covariance matrix, and the weights of each of the Gaussian. And so it's invariant to permutations because you aggregate them using a sum function and it's constant in size. So basically when you take a point cloud and you compute its Fisher vector, you get a fixed size um, uh, vector. And there are additional theoretical um, uh, justification for this. This is not a heuristic. Uh, it's asymptotically optimal uh, feature vector. 
So moving on to our presentation, which is called the 3D Modified Fisher Vector, or 3D MFV. Basically, it's a hybrid representation. When I say hybrid, is something between point statistics that lie on a grid. So as I said before, we use the spherical Gaussians uh, on the grid, and we represent point clouds using that GMM. Uh, and we compute the, the Fisher vectors of 3D point clouds, only we use additional what we call symmetric functi functions. It's symmetric in the sense that the point order doesn't matter. So if the Fisher vector uses only a summation, we also use uh, maximum and minimum uh, of all the point samples. So basically what you see here is a point cloud of a, of a computer screen. You can see, it's a little bit hard to see with the projector, but you can see the Gaussians uh, Essentially, the Gaussians are infinite, but here we mark them with a single uh, uh, standard deviation. So when you compute the, the, the 3D MFV representation, you get, so here each column is a Gaussian, you get a very unique signature. This is the representation. So let's go through this uh, a little slower and step by step. So let's take a simple case of a single point in a single Gaussian and compute the Fisher vector representation. So we take the derivative with respect to the, to the weight and the derivative with respect to the mean and the derivative with, with respect to the uh, standard deviation and we get this signature for this Gaussian. Once we move the point a little bit, you can see how this signature change, how this representation change. And this continues to happen as we move the point around, we can see how the representation continues on changing according to the point's location. So moving on to a more um, complex situation in three dimensions, so here on the left you can see uh, a single point in a, in a a single 3D point in a single 3D Gaussian, and all of the derivatives with respect to the different um, Gaussian parameters with the different uh, uh, symmetric functions, which include the summation, maximum, and minimum. So you can see here how it changes as the point moves, and as the point moves around, the representation continues on changing. So this is still rather a simple case, but look what happened when we take a more complex case of a point cloud, for example, of a car, and we use a two by two by two grid, you see that we can get a very unique representation. Um, and I should mention that each of the columns here is a Gaussian with a spatial, spatial location. So each column here corresponds to uh, one of these Gaussians on the grid. Okay, so it's not an image. This is not input as an image to our network that I will present in the next slide. This is, is a four-dimensional matrix, essentially. So once we computed the 3D MFV representation, we got the point cloud as input, we put our Gaussians on it, and we computed the 3D MFV representation. We can now feed it into a 3D convolutional neural network architecture that we designed for the task of classification. Uh, it's composed of multiple uh, 3D inception inspired layers, uh, which in the end we get what we call a learned representation that we feed into a fully connected classifier. So we tested our method on benchmark dataset, which include the ModelNet 40 and the ModelNet 10. Um, it's a challenging dataset, which composed of CAD models mostly. Um, it, with 40 man-made objects for the ModelNet 40. So we use approximately 10,000 for training and two and a half thousand for testing. Um, you can see some examples here of the objects in the data set. The, the models are, the, the data is given as a triangle mesh, but we sample points on the mesh and we introduce some uh, data augmentations such as noise, rotations, etc. And you can see here that we compare ourselves to both voxel-based methods and uh, point-based methods, and we achieve, uh, to, the, to the time of publication, uh, state-of-the-art results regarding uh, accuracy, if we compare um, in apples-to-apples apples sort of sense. Um, Yes, so we wanted to explore a little bit uh, the properties of this algorithm and uh, of this method and, and test how different uh, parameters of the algorithm affect it. So first thing we did here was we checked the, how the grid size affects things. So 
we took a very, very, very coarse of a 3 by 3 by 3 uh, Gaussian grid uh, and tested up to a 16 uh, cube Gaussian grid. And you can see that performance, um, and we tested it with respect to the number of points. So this is accuracy versus the number of points. So you can see that the more uh, Gaussians that we use, we improve the results until it somewhat saturates between the 8 and 16 uh, versions. Just for comparison, we draw the point net results somewhere over here. Uh, another question was, uh, uh, another interesting question is uh, how the standard deviation affects. So we use a uniform grid, but what happens when we increase the, the standard deviation or decrease it? And what we can see here is basically that the standard deviation does not change the result much as long as it's not too small. Um, because when it's too small, very few points affect the representation and it becomes neg negligible. And we also tested here how, the, how different um, symmetric functions affect the, the performance and results. So uh, we tried the uh, minimum alone, maximum alone, summation alone, which is the Fisher vector, and uh, sum of squares, and eventually all of them together. You can see that the results are somewhat comparable. Um, and we used it with different types of classifiers. So in this case, there is no network in between, uh, except for the, the classifier. We just used the, 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 the representation fed directly into a classifier. And you can see that the network itself introduces significant boost to performance. Additional challenges that we wanted to explore was how robust is our method to different types of data corruption. So what you can see here on the left is how we deal with missing data. So we tested um, uniform deletion, which basically uh, means how we handle different densities, uh, which is very common in, in sensors, where points that are far away are far less dense as points that are close to the sensor. And you can see that uh, this is the blue line here. You can see that we can get up to approximately 60% less data and not have a significant impact for, uh, regarding the accuracy, regarding the result. And as for occlusion, so we basically took, chose a point and removed nearby points to simulate occlusions. And you can see that the representation itself is sensitive to this type of effect. So you can see it in the, in the red line, which declines rather fast. However, if we introduce occlusions while training, then the network is able to um, compensate for that. And we can see that approximately 50% uh, of the object can be removed and the, the accuracy does not, um, is not affected much. Uh, and another test for robustness was the case of outliers. So what happens if we introduce outliers? They change the representation quite significantly. So you can see that when there's no um, outliers during training, then the results decline very fast, but when, when we introduce outliers while training, it maintains uh, uh, the results for uh, approximately 5% to 10% of outliers don't affect as much, and then it linearly, approximately linearly declines. We also, we also tested for the case of uh, inserting perturbation, so ga basically Gaussian noise, and you can see that it, in this case it doesn't matter much if we, um, if we use it while training or not, there is some difference, but it's fairly robust all the same. And rotations is, uh, means that what happens if we take the same point cloud and rotate it and try to classify it all the same. Uh, and what happened here is that our representation is, um, of course, not, not, does not compensate it in the representation itself, but when, when we introduce it while training, then the network is able to um, to compensate for that and maintain its performance um, regardless of the rotations. So this is all, all of these tests were done on the, on the ModelNet 40 data set because it's synthetic, it's CAD models, it, it's easy to manipulate, but we wanted to explore what happens when we take some real data. So we used the Sydney uh, data set, which includes uh, 14 object classes. This is a very challenging data set because first of all, it, it has very few examples, only a little bit less than 600 um, um, total objects. And the classes are very Im imbalanced. And the results show that we can achieve uh, better results than competing methods, even on this uh, very challenging data. <coughs> Sorry, data set. 
Uh, one major advantage of our method is the fact that it operates in real time. And this is despite the overhead of, com of computing the representation. So what you see here on the left is the time it takes to compute the representation. It has a theoretical time complexity of, o of uh, t times k, where t is the number of points and k is the number of Gaussians. So you can see here that, for, that it, as the number of points increases, each of the, these lines represent different numbers of Gaussians. So you can see a linear, linear increase in time. However, uh, and this is measured in milliseconds, okay? So for uh, 2,000 points in the five by five by five, it takes less than a millisecond to compute the representation itself. And when we put it in line with uh, existing uh, state-of-the-art other methods, you can see the, uh, for example, the point net method uh, increases linearly uh, more than us. This is because the point net method is, um, uh, depends linearly of the number of points and the number of operators in the network, while our method is only linear uh, for the representation comp computation time, but for the inference time, the, the time is constant. So this is both the representation and inference time all tied together. So to sum up, we introduced a new hybrid representation for 3D point clouds. Uh, which is structured, ordered, and sample size independent, uh, which tackles the main challenges of dealing with point clouds in the context of, in the context of deep learning. Um, it offers uh, an efficient way of encoding spatial distributions, and it enables the use of the powerful 3D CNNs with the point cloud data. Additionally, we designed a new deep CNN architecture called 3DMFV Net, uh, based on this representation, and we use it for point cloud classification and obtain state-of-the-art results in real time. I'll be glad to take any questions. For more information, you can visit my website. Uh, the code is available on GitHub. Thank you very much. Hi, great work. Great work. Um, I have a question about the Gaussians. You fix them ahead of time. Can you make them part of the learning process so you learn the meaning and the covariance of each Gaussian as part of the training set, uh, stage? Yeah, so um, we tackle this issue. The problem is that the standard deviation appears in the, in the denominator, so it, the gradients explode very fast. But we did try to pre-learn the, the, the positions of the different Gaussians. The problem is that if you learn the positions of the Gaussian, you can't use a CNN anymore because it's not on a grid, right? You, you can use a fully connected or something like that, but, but you lose the, the shift in variance power of the convolutions. So this is the main issue in that sense. Have you tested the, your method on Kitty dataset? We did not test it on the Kitty dataset. However, I expect it to perform similarly to the Sydney one. I think they don't have a per se classification benchmark, at least for the point when th this paper was published. But it can work on that. The, the thing is that it needs the, um, the point clouds need to be like uh, separated. You need to have the, the point cloud of the objects for training and. Okay, another question. Did you use the uh, intensity? I, I'm not familiar with the Sydney data set, but did you use the intensity values? No, no to, just X, Y, Z coordinates for the, uh, for the points. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.